So, salam alaikum to everyone who's joined us this evening for what will be an insightful discussion on a variety of matters related to the current COVID-19 pandemic. We will be joined by Sayyid Hadi and Sayyid Hassan Rizvi from the United States and Sayyid Ali Imran and myself from Qom. As a quick disclaimer, while we appreciate there is a holistic way to look at the pandemic, we will only be, touch we will only be looking to touch on the religious responses and as for the other aspects related to the virus, the medical side, the mental health, you should always refer to the experts in those fields. We pray that you're all keeping well, making the most of Sha'ban, and that Allah protects everyone at this difficult time, keeps us all healthy, and most importantly, he hastens the reappearance of the awaited Imam. So to begin, Al-Coronavirus, wa ma adraka ma huwa al-Coronavirus. It has brought the world to a standstill, decimated economies and put billions of people in lockdown, a situation unprecedented in the 21st century. In the last few weeks, it has been spreading like wildfire, causing almost a million infections, well, actually over a million infections now and thousands of deaths. COVID-19 is a type of virus from the cor coronavirus group, and its symptoms can be deadly and fatal, especially for those with underlying health conditions and who are elderly. However, for those familiar with human history, this is nothing new. Viruses, plagues, pandemics, humanity has often found itself at the mercy of these ruthless microscopic organisms. And more often than not, it has left chaos in its wake. A hundred years ago, you have the 1918, 1920 Spanish flu, up to 50 million dead. If you go back a couple of hundred more years, you have the Black Death, up to 200 million calculated dead with that. So we'll begin this discussion by asking the question, do we have historical records of viruses and plagues hitting the Islamic world? Sayyid Ali Imran, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Sadiq. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters, all the viewers who are watching us. Uh, as we go through tonight's discussion, if you guys have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them on the side. And if we're able to entertain them, then inshallah, we'll try to uh, address them. Uh, once again, thank you, Sadiq, for that uh, introduction. As far as the, uh, you know, history uh, of epidemics or plagues or, you know, breakouts or whatever you want to call them, there's different categories for these uh, diseases. Yeah, we, we do have a lot of uh, documentation as far as the uh, Muslim scholarly uh, circles are concerned. Uh, so I'm going to just give you guys a brief uh, breakdown of what, how did the Muslim scholars look at these sort of uh, plagues, uh, the ta'un or pestilence, waba, as they would call them. How did they look at these phenomenon in, in, you know, throughout history? So what we do find is that during the time of the Prophet wasallam, we don't really see such an outbreak occur. But what we see is that during the time of the second Khalifa, there is a plague which is very popular. Uh, you know, it was very, became a very famous plague amongst the Muslim uh, communities known as the Plague of Amwas. Uh, Amwas is a village in uh, Palestine, you know, near Al Quds. So, you know, you can imagine at that time the Muslims had conquered these lands. So, there are a lot of companions of the Prophet who are present in these uh, in these areas, in these you know, in these locations. And this Taun struck the vicinity and. They say, you know, record have said around 25,000 companions and, you know, other individuals, the residents, the citizens of those areas, they all died. And this single plague sort of became the, you know, the structure, the founding basis of all later works and all later interpretations of how Muslims looked at the phenomenon of, you know, ta'un, plagues or, or pestilence, as they say. And because of this, you know, why was this a question for the Muslim scholars? Why was why was this a problem? You know, did they not know about the fact that plagues did occur or pestilence did occur? Yeah, they knew about it. But what was very shocking and sort of surprising for them was that why was it that the Muslims and particularly the companions of the Holy Prophet, why were they being struck with, uh, you know, this sort of deadly disease? 25,000, it had killed many, many prominent companions of the Prophet were killed during this time. So the Muslims took this event 
and they sort of began interpreting it over the course of time, over the course of centuries. And many scholars, uh, particularly amongst the Sunni scholarship, you know, you had a lot of uh, different books that were written, interpretations, commentaries, even small treatises, treaties that were written on, you know, the phenomenon of plague. And what do you, what are you supposed to do as a Muslim? You know, are you supposed to escape? Are you not supposed to escape? And in this process, what we saw is that multiple sort of perspectives sort of started to originate amongst the Muslims. And by the way, when I say Muslims right now, I'm speaking in general. I'm not sp uh, speaking specifically about the Shi'i scholarship, which I will touch upon as well. You know, how did they look at this? So in the general Muslim world, one of the earliest interpretations that the scholars gave was that based on their ideology of Jabr, which is that, you know, there is no free will that you are supposed to sort of just admit and acknowledge the fate that is in front of you totally. You know, things are completely out of your hand. Just accept it and basically, you know, don't escape, essentially, you know. And we have this tradition that is being spread on the Internet, you know, since a few weeks I've been looking at it, where there's a prophetic tradition that says that if you hear of a uh, disease or, you know, um, of a plague being spread in a land, then, then, you know, if you're outside of that land, don't enter it. And if you're inside of that land, don't sort of leave that land, okay? And many, uh, if you look at the commentaries that people are, you know, making about this tradition, it is that they're looking at it from a very sort of 21st century, 20th century uh, lens, and they're saying, oh, look, the prophet is talking about quarantines, the, the sort of quarantine that we are, you know, many of us are going through today. But, you know, the Muslim scholars uh, during their earlier generations, they didn't look at it from that perspective. For them, this was actually... Prophet saying you are just supposed to, you know, just meant to accept your destiny and not escape, not sort of fight the decree of Allah that has been ordained for you. Um, maybe we can understand that, you know, perhaps there was this idea of Jabr being fed into this tradition, or at least it's in its interpretation. Okay. So that was sort of one understanding of how the Muslims looked at looked at this phenomenon. A second interpretation that the earlier Muslim scholars uh, sort of gave about plagues and you know outbreaks and so on disease, disease outbreaks was that there were a couple of traditions that they had in their books that were being transmitted that said that the plague that sort of occurs because the plague of Amwas was not the only plague that occurred later on during the time of Bani Umayyah, Bani Abbas there were other uh, disease outbreaks as well that occurred they would say that if you remember the people of Egypt during the time of Prophet Musa alayhi salam, that God struck them with the different types of, you know, plagues, the tufan, as in the verse of the Quran, the floods and the locusts and so on. You know, one of them was the, you know, like a plague as has been recorded in history. So they had certain traditions where the Prophet is saying that the plague is this very same plague which was sent down as a punishment on the people of Egypt. And this plague sort of dies out and it, you know, comes back again. It dies out and it comes back again. So many Muslim scholars also believe that this is just a continuation of that same punishment that Allah has sent on the people of Egypt and it sort of dies, diminishes and it you know, comes back again. So these were some uh, opinions that the Muslim scholars held. But a, you know, perhaps even a predominant position or perspective of how the Muslims looked into this, uh, you know, these type of outbreaks was that of mercy and punishment. Okay, It was a rahma and it was an adab. And interestingly, we have riwayat in our own books, the Shi'i books, that also allude to this. So we have a tradition from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, where he says that the, the ta'un, which is the plague, it is an azab for a qawm, it is a punishment for a qawm, and it is a rahma for others. It is a sort of, you know, a source of mercy. And the companion actually asks, you know, how could that be? And the Imam gives him a response. He says, just like the fire of hell, or Jahannam, it is a punishment for the kuffar, the disbelievers, and it is a blessing and a mercy for the angels who are, you know, uh, protecting or sort of overlooking the hellfire. And some of the scholars have said, you know, what do you mean it is a mercy for the angels of hellfire? And they have said that this is to do with their servitude, the fact that they are able to do a ta'a, you know, obey the commands of Allah while they are the caretakers of, of hell. So you had these ideas in the Muslim world and as I said that this was 
you know, this was like a Sunni sort of approach. The Sunni scholarship had written about these uh, about these perspectives. Many prominent uh, Sunni scholars like Suyuti and uh, Ibn Qutaybah, even even Ibn Taymiyyah, and so on. What about the Shi'i scholars? You know, what did what did they have to say about this? You see, because we do not believe in the idea of Jabr, you know that, that you know there's there you know we have the idea that there is will and there you know pre. The Shi'i scholars did not come up with ideas or interpretations or, or even fiqhi positions where they would say things like, you are not allowed to escape a city when there is a pestilence. Okay. On the contrary, we find fuqaha, our own fuqaha, who would say the opposite. They would say that if you know, or even if you speculate that there is a you know danger to your life, you're supposed to, you know, it's wajib to actually escape. So, you know, they did not take those prophetic traditions, they, they did not interpret them in the way some of the Sunni fuqaha were doing. Because some of the Sunni fuqaha were very adamant that it's haram to escape uh, a place. So I'm going to give one example of a Shi'i scholar <coughs> who, you know, there's a book there's a book that he wrote, Sayyid Ni'matullah Jazairi. He's a 12th century Hijri. Uh, he died in 12th century Hijri, which is 1701, uh, you know, AD. And he was a very influential Akhbari-minded scholar, a student of Alama Majlisi. And he wrote a treatise on the idea of and you know, can you escape from it? Are you supposed to escape? And he's primarily engaging with Sunni scholarship in that. So obviously it's a long treatise, but what he says in terms of what are the scholars expected to do when there is ta'un in a city, he says that when an outbreak occurs, it's necessary for the scholars to encourage people to repent. Okay, so this idea of istighfar, which even today many scholars are you know pushing and they're they're encouraging and reminding people. You know, stop committing sins, ask people to give charity, uh, encourage encourage them to fast. And he goes on, he goes on and he explains, you know, scholars should take the community out to the deserts, you know, to pray and mourn. And he even says that the rulers and the rich people of the city should accompany this group of scholars and the, you know, the, the laymen and the, the citizens. Because Allah wishes to see these, you know, people who are in positions of power, he wishes to see them humbled. Okay. So this was the sort of idea that the Shi'i scholars uh, were promoting. Now I want to mention that amongst the Ahl sunnah the Muhaddithin, the Ahl al-Hadith, and also amongst the Shi'i, the Akhbari sort of minded scholars, there was this idea that, you know, uh, the scientific sort of conclusions that, by, that were given by the Muslim physicians at that time, they were not taken very seriously, okay? So, for example, especially particularly amongst the Ahlul, Ahlul Sunnah, uh, uh, you know, Muhaddithin. So you did have ideas where if the Muslim physicians would say, uh, you know, at that time, their idea was that the outbreak spreads because of the air. It's airborne, essentially. Unlike today, which they believe, you know, is spread by the viruses and the germs. And the Ahlul Sunnah, uh, Muhaddithin, some of them, they would try to rebuttal that by simply, you know, referring to a hadith and referring to, for example, you know, the, the physical things that they would see and so on. But the Shi'i scholars in general, they did not seem to have this approach. Okay, they did not seem to have this approach as far as what we found. And as, as I mentioned earlier that, you know, we had scholars who would go on to say that if you believe and even if you speculate that your life is in danger, it is wajib to escape. Or for example, you know, if you believe that on a certain journey, you may die of a you know plague or or any other disease. You know, for example, Hajj does not become wajib. So you know that's sort of the idea that the Shi'i scholars in the past have had, and uh, hopefully that sort of you no know, discuss concern, inshallah. Thanks for that very precise and very detailed summary. Just a quick question to follow on: Do we have anything written? After Ni'matullah Jazairi, he was obviously a scholar who lived at the time of the Safavids, but obviously that's a couple of hundred years ago. Does anything come to mind about any treaties written on a similar subject? So I did not find anything um, you know, written by a scholar, but we do have records of actually quite a lot of books written by uh, during the Qajar period, uh, you know, before, which is like the 19th century essentially. Uh, and the Qajar period, this was a period where, you know, a lot of princes, uh, you know, prince, uh, you know, certain, you know, sons of the kings and the shahs that were ruling, uh, they had written quite a number of books, actually. 
Um, so because these were not scholarly works, meaning they were not written by, let's say, you know, scholars from the Hawza, the Fuqaha or so, or, you know, in, in that category, um, I did not want to mention them as the scholarly position. But yeah, otherwise there were books written by Shi'i individuals, you know, physicians and doctors, and as I said, princes and so on. Fascinating. So that brings us to the present times. Uh, the virus first appeared in Wuhan, China. 31st December was when the first case was reported or a mysterious case was reported. And the city was brought to a complete lockdown three weeks after, after which it spread to various different countries. And Italy and Iran were hit particularly hard in mid-February. It has now spread to all corners of the world and poses an existential threat to life and society as we know it. And on this point, it would be good to touch on some ideas on what Islam has to say about physical illness. How does Islam understand the world? What's our take on Islamic ontology when we want to understand, for example, physical illnesses? And what do we have in traditions, for example? Do we have anything that the Imams themselves recommended or would they say when it comes to illnesses? And how do we reconcile supplication with taking precaution and seeking cure. So to tackle these questions, the first subject I want to touch on is the idea of Islamic ontology. Ontology is basically the understanding of the world, understanding of existence. And the most fundamental principle put within this Islamic ontology is that of causality. And this principle of causality can be understood on two levels. Firstly, the idea that nothing occurs except that there is something else that caused it. There is no child without a parent. There is no smoke, smoke without a fire. There is no water without the combination of hydrogen and oxygen. So this is the first level, that everything that happens in this world happens through the principle of causality. And secondly, none of these causes occur independently of the sovereignty of God. Obviously, we believe that God, who's, a, who's a, the ultimate power, he has everything under his control. And all of these causes, they ascend vertically to him. And everything that we do, everything that we see in this world ends up going back to God. And this is something we actually see in the traditions ourselves. So Imam Sadiq salam in Al-Kafi, he, he, uh, he has a hadith where he says, Ab Allah an yajri al -ashya illa bi -asbab, That Allah will not ordain or regulate affairs except through causes. And he has made for everything a cause. And Mullah Sadr, for example, when he comments on this tradition, he says this principle of causality is the most important principle when it comes to the ma'arif of Islam, when it comes to your knowledge, when it comes to actually understanding the world and existence. And he goes to the extent in saying that if we don't understand causality, then we won't, we won't be able to understand anything. We won't be able to understand our Lord. We won't be able to understand the Rububiyyah. We won't be able to understand Ma'ad, Risala. In the sense that everything that we have goes back to this. And what's very interesting is we see in the Quran as well that at times the prophets and the prophets were working within this regulation of causality, meaning they themselves were subject to this framework that God has established. And we know, for example, that the prophets fell ill, the imams fell ill. And even though for some this might be a surprise, the prophets and the imams at times would fall ill. And they would they themselves would seek means or seek to be cured through the means that Allah has established. And at times we kind of forget that the imams and the prophets themselves had a heavenly side. They had an earthly side to themselves. Their existence was almost composite. It had a celestial side, it had a divine side, that side through which revelation was revealed, that side through which inspiration was revealed. And at the other time, they had a human side to themselves. They would walk with people, they would eat with people, they would engage in relations. And unfortunately, sometimes this gets a bit skewed. We focus too so much on the celestial side and the divine side that we forget that actually they were human beings as well in physical bodies. And this is our theology on this. So we see, for example, in the Quran, when the story of Yunus is mentioned in Surah Safat, Allah says that when he comes out of the whale, So we took him, we brought him out onto a ara, which is a desert, which is uh, an open desert. And he wasn't feeling, and he wasn't in a good state. Then Allah says that we made a tree for him. And in the tafsir of this, in the exegesis of this, in the explanation of this, it's explained that 
he was given a tree so that he could take shade. And the traditions continue that he was also given some fruits and some vegetables and he healed himself that way. So he, the Imam, the Prophet himself was working within this paradigm, this framework. The Imams themselves would um, work within this framework of causality. So that's the first thing, the focus on this principle of causality that how Allah has created and regulates this world. Secondly, when we look at traditions of the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt about how to deal with illnesses, what's rather surprising is they seem to give a two-tiered approach, meaning a two-leveled approach. So this, take this hadith, for example, from the Holy Prophet. He says, So avoid taking medicine insofar as your body can tolerate it or insofar as your body can cope. So it seems like the Prophet is trying to suggest that allow your body the ability to heal in the first instance when you know, for example, it's a mild illness, it's a mild uh, symptoms that you're feeling. Don't immediately rush to actually go in to get medicine. And Sheikh Subhani, when he comments on this, he says, كُلُّ الْأَحَدِيثِ تَشِيرُ إِلَىٰ أَنَّ عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ أَنْ لَا يَسْتَعْمَلُ الدَّوَاءِ That from these traditions, you can get an understanding that humans, that people, are not necessarily required to go straight for medicine until there's an actual need for it. it. The urgency actually requires it. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that you submit to the, to the illness. It is not the imams on, oh, sorry, the prophet here isn't actually advocating an unscientific method of dealing with things. He's not actually uh, suggesting that we take a defeatist approach, but he perhaps could be suggesting that let the body first try to deal with it. The body itself has miraculous abilities and defense mechanisms, immune systems, and that, that could actually help in the first instance deal with it. And it can also allow the body to strengthen itself. And this is also something being looked at within scientific circles itself. So for example, you have a science writer called Jo Marchant. Uh, she's written a book called Cure, a journey into the science of mind over body. So obviously the science that we have today, the medicine that we have today is heavily predicated on this physicalist understanding of the world an understanding of the world that there is no existence beyond the physical realm that we can obviously touch and sense. So that given with case studies and with experience in history, that the mind itself, for example, can play a role in helping cure illnesses. And another interesting thing that I came across about a month or two ago, when this whole thing came out and I started to read a little bit more, I came across a book called Jeremy Brown, by Jeremy Brown, Dr. Jeremy Brown, on influenza. And he touches on, it's a great book, and he touches on the Spanish flu, the influenza that hits that hit Europe in uh, the 1918. And here he comes halfway through the discussion about a page or two, he talks about chicken soup. And I was really surprised when I saw this. I was like, why is this doctor talking about chicken soup? And he says that at the time, people actually consumed chicken soup, believing that it was actually a cure to help with colds and flus. And later on, science itself actually came and confirmed that when it comes to things like chicken soup, it's actually more effective in dealing with very mild cases of cold and flu than some over-the-top, over-the-counter medicines you might get available because it helps in the nasal, the nasal, uh, the passage, the, the flow of mucus, nasal uh, opening, the nasal passage. And so, again, going back to what the tradition is saying here, when we know that the illness is mild, it isn't always the case that you should go straight for the doctors or for the medicine that you have available. Because the Prophet then continues, so this is level two, that's level one, where you know that you have the ability to actually cope with the illness. Level two, for either alam yahtamil ad-da, the Prophet continues, if you are unable to bear the illness that you're feeling, if the symptoms are too much, then obviously it's a no-brainer, you go and actually, you go and get your medicine, you go and make sure you get treated. So that's that. We looked at how the imams, for how the imams and the prophets would tend to suggest and recommend things to people who are ill. First of all, see if you can cope. Uh, if not, go and take some medicine. Um, so now it goes to the next question. Now, what about how do we reconcile this with du'a? When we make du'a, is it contradictory to the fact that we're now taking physical precaution, or the fact that, um, or the fact that we actually have to go and seek medicine? So here we can look at the idea of du'a. So du'a itself plays a dual function. It has two functions to it. Obviously, the first function of du'a, which is obviously a, a lot more familiar to us, is the idea that when we make du'a, we're really asking God for our hajjat. We're asking him for what we need. 
we have something that's come up, we're facing some difficulties, we'll make a door. And that itself, because we're so sort of accustomed to that side of the, the dua itself, it's become the more apparent understanding of dua. But actually, the dua itself has another function, and that is to inculcate this spirit of servitude. It's to inculcate this acceptance that we are in a state of poverty in front of the one who is needless. We are in a state of destitution in front of the one who has everything. And out of these two, so we're saying du'a has a function of two things. First of all, obviously, it's your du'a. The second is actually to re re so to cultivate this spirit of obudiya, of servitude. And out of these two, the scholars of Atlaq have explained that the primary function is actually the second. Du'a is actually a tool that you use to reinforce that sense that you are a servant. And while, obviously, there are secondary benefits to that of obviously du'a, the main function for that is actually, no, realize your poverty, realize your destitution in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have interesting verses from the Qur'an on this respect. So, for example, the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah that says, Qala Rabbukum ud'uni ustajib lakum, call me, I'll respond straight away after them. It says, inna ladhini yastakbiruna an ibadati, those who are too proud to even do such a thing. So, again, it's going back to the state of the nafs, it's going back to the state of the ego. Another verse which is actually quite insightful is the last verse in Surah Al-Furqan where, where it said dua that if it wasn't for your du'as that God, God would not give you any value that if it wasn't for your constant supplication that God himself would not actually show any affection to you and it's very interesting here, when you look into the works of the Mufassir, you look into the works of Tafassir. So I was looking at Kanz al-Daqaiq of Qumi Ashadi, and he himself says this verse shows that without dua, insan, the human being, loses his distinction. He loses that value that distincts him and makes him more superior to over every other creation. So we see that the secondary function, of, sorry, the main function of dua is itself re-cultivating that aspect of servitude and... Obviously, that secondary function is there and it has its own place, but it shouldn't be considered to be the main one. So that's that. Now, coming to another discussion that actually happened. So about a few weeks ago, no, a few weeks ago, about two weeks ago, the harams were closed in Iran. Uh, the mosques were closed. And this brought a question up, like, should the harams be closed? Are there not places of shafa'ah? Uh, why are the masajids being closed? And of course, undoubtedly, the harams are a place of shafa'ah. Undoubtedly, they are a place of sanctuary for the mu'mineen, a place to go and to take refuge. And those in Qom will obviously, tell, will obviously say that when it comes to the benefits of being here or being anywhere where there is a haram, the haram is obviously the priority. However, given how rapidly the virus transmitted from person to person in this situation and the need that the government had to get it under control, it was essential for people to be taken out of harm's way and places where, lo where social gatherings were taking place that they had to be closed down to ensure that people weren't put into risk and to harm's way. And Islam tells us that we have these principles in jurisprudence, for example, La Dharar and the Fuqaha, they discuss this over and over again, that you shouldn't actually put yourself in harm's way. And one thing that Sayyid Ali Mwan actually mentioned as well is that even when it comes to things like Hajj, for example, when Hajj becomes wajib on someone, it's dependent on a number of different things. It's dependent upon, obviously, your financial situation and other things. And one thing that is actually dependent upon also, and all the fuqaha agree, is that if you fear hardship or if you fear harm on the way towards Hajj, then the Hajj will no longer become wajib for you. It won't become free so we see in this instance so we see in this instance of actual laws that can take place when it comes to things like hardship and harm and obviously if we take the path of the Olo a for Tayori, we can say that it can be applied in other areas so those are just some thoughts on those um, on those ones on a few different topics we looked about how Islamic ontology is essentially based on the law of causality we looked at how the imams themselves talk about how to deal with illnesses and we touched lastly on two things the function of dua and its ramifications on whether the haram being closed is contradictory to being a 
place of shafa. Thank you, Brother Sadiq. Um, I think one of the points that we really should emphasize here, which you made um, at the right, very beginning, is that idea of cause and effect and how that plays a role um, and how much thought we give to that when we try to analyze these issues. So you see a lot of people when they're talking about um, what I've seen, people talking about this, they're trying to work out, did God do this? Did he do it directly? Is this a punishment? Is this, you know, um, is this warfare? Um, or simply of how they should act or react to it, right? Um, and sometimes when you trace it back, it doesn't seem like there's a logical, um, um, there doesn't seem like there's a logical sort of pattern that can, you can trace it back to, which would highlight exactly how this came to be about. And I think that's very important that we mentioned that even when it comes to the prophets, uh, they're required to go by for the laws of cause and effect. Now, we're not saying cause and effect as we understand them in a material way. God has his own system and, you know, things like dua can play a part in that and do obviously play a part in that according to the Quranic discourse. Um, verses simple, the simple verses like not simple verses, but verses like "Man yajallahu makhrajan, yajallahu makhrajan." That whoever has taqwa, God will make a way out for them. Now, this to get out of, to get that escape route, to get that um, relief, that makhraj, you need to have taqwa. There's a requirement to get there, and then it goes on to say, you know, later on in the verse, and whoever has tawakkul on God, God is enough for them. Right, so this idea of tawakkul, having the tawakkul there, it doesn't stop there. Then it goes on to say, um, God, in Allah, that God will make his affairs come to be, God will make his plan come to be. But for everything, there's a qadr, there's a limit, there's a um, he's ordained, there's an ordinance for it. So through this, from the very beginning, and this is two verses, the end of one verse and the second verses, we see this. I, a lot of these ideas come into play together, the cause and effect, the fact that the cause and effect is greater than the cause and effect that we imagine, that God has the power, that we should do tawakkul. Um, but also remember that there is a framework within which God himself works. And there's many verses that do point to this, the idea of, for example, um, when the prophet was praying when they were in battle and they wanted to pray what happened they were told while some of you are praying a group of you stand back with weapons god didn't say don't worry go ahead all of you pray i will protect you i'll send down the angels don't worry about it it wasn't you know there wasn't uh, they, you take your precautions and god will do the rest um and other verses i don't want to continue we've already the point made clear i just wanted to really high that like that point that this idea of god working with asbab and using asbab and for us to really have a focus on that and understand that um and not really try to mystify everything more than necessary i'm going to stop here and um let anyone who wants to interject interject or continue on to the next point well that being said there's actually a lot more we could open up uh, on that discussion. Thank you for opening up that discussion for us, Sayyid Hadi. Uh, but we'll leave it there because there's still a lot more to continue. Unless anyone else watching wants to throw a question, then feel free to stop our. And there's a question about the path. book. Sorry? There's a question about the book that you mentioned. Uh huh. It's called Influenza by Dr. Jeremy Brown. It's a very nice read on the 1918 to 1920 pan pandemic. Uh, so influenza, yeah, influenza pandemic, and it looks about how they actually tried to they traced it back, and he, it's quite a nice book that looks into how they got to the bottom of what actually caused it, and it's a good read, especially given the context we're in. Uh, so moving on to our next section, um, obviously Iran being hit, and Iran obviously the hub of a lot of things going on in the Middle East. It's uh, the place of the Ahlul Bayt, many hadith we have speak about the sanctity of Qom. And obviously that comes with the involvement of the ulama, the involvement of the marja'iyya. The... So one question we can now throw open here is what is the role of the clergy? What is the role of the marja'iyya during this crisis? What is a layman's responsibility? You're sitting at home, 
you're you're hearing all this is going on. What do you do? What can you do? What should you be doing when it comes to listening to, for example, the what the health experts are saying, the advice that the health experts are giving? Do the advice does the advice of health experts need specific approval, for example, from a scholar? Does it need a stamped approval from the manager, for example? Should a person be taking the advice to a scholar for verification? Some things that we've been seeing. Um, so I'll just throw this open. What do you guys think about that? How would we go to begin to explore that and discuss that? Thank you, uh, everybody, for your comments. Um, uh, there's a few points I wanted to discuss about this idea of wall, uh, the individuals who are looking to the ulama, looking to the maraja, uh, looking to the local scholars, uh, what is their role. Of course, we look to the Hawzas, and Najaf, and Qom, and all around the world. So, you know, sometimes this question, although I think it's, it's in our minds all the time, right? And now because of uh, whenever there is this pandemic or issue or event or something goes crazy in the world, we're always looking for somebody to solve it for us, right? And behind these questions, it seems like most people back home, they're kind of confused about the roles. What exactly is a scholar or Molana or Qibla or whatever you want to call them, Sheikh, Sayyid, and the Marajah, the Ayatollahs, what exactly is their role? And then what kind of relationship am I supposed to form with them? And then in between them, or somewhere in that same area, we also have these health experts as well, who sometimes contend for that intellectual space. And within our communities as well, we have, let's say, you know, a humble, pious, muttaqi, religious individual who happens to have, let's say, expertise in some field who also wants to, you know, offer their two cents on every single matter, whether it's fiqh or usul, they want to give their own version of the ahkam, you know, they want to give their medical advice, etc. So all these things are in our mind. So behind all of this, it's this confusion on what exactly are the limits and roles of people in this situation. So first, let's start with the marajah, right? Let's, let's start at the top. To kind of simplify for us, marajah, Right? These ayatollahs, they're there to provide us with general rulings without applying it on our behalf. Meaning they'll say, this type of drink, this type of food is haram. It's up for you to go and do the tashkhis. You go and identify the subject of it, right? the subject matter. They're not going to go and tell you that these specific drinks are haram. They'll give you a general category and you have to go and figure it out yourself from there. And it's not just this. Think about other examples. Whenever we're talking about, let's say, smoking. Uh, so many marajah, again, there's always a back and forth about this topic too. So normally, most marajah will give a very general kind of answer, a categorical answer that if it leads to so-and-so type of harm, then you can't engage in this action, meaning you can't smoke. So they're not going to go and tell you what the Surgeon General says, or a medical expert says, or the whatever International Cancer Society says. They're not going to say that. It's up for you and I to do that research or for the medical experts in our communities to come forward and tell us what we have to do in that sense, right? So the maraje are just kind of sitting there on these legal boundaries. That's where they are. Now, with that aside, and you know, we should also keep in mind that since their boundaries are legal, they're not there to offer us medical advice, right? So this is why if you see the advice of all the scholars have been the same thing in this whole kind of COVID crisis. They've been saying, follow the experts, listen to the experts. If they say to stay at home, stay at home. If they say don't shake hands, don't shake hands. If going to a Jama'at prayer is going to lead to the spread of the disease, then don't go to Jama'at prayers. Right there, they're allowing for us to refer to these medical experts, because again, it's not their, uh, their subject matter. So they'll say, look, you have to stick with what they're saying so that your life is not in danger, so that Islam is not in danger, right? And those, those principles then are working within these two boundaries. Okay. Now, another point too, which I don't know if it'll be controversial or not, but 
again, since we're saying that Madajer, they're there to provide legal boundaries, then we also have to keep in mind that it's not necessarily the case that akhlaq or spiritual advice, mystical advice, is going to fall within their purview and their jurisdiction. Meaning, a marja is a marja because of their legal, uh, legal meaning their actual fiqh uh, expertise, and what they know in legal theory. It doesn't mean that they've studied, let's say, history to the full extent as other scholars who might not be a marja in legal issues. They may, may not have spent a lot of time in, let's say, the history and historical movements of akhlaq or studying Sufism, or studying philosophy. No, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that. Uh, do we have Maraje who have studied all the subjects? Yes, we have. We do have them now. But that doesn't necessarily mean every single Maraje is going to be like that. And you know, one of the issues that I think sometimes we find in our, uh, among our community members is that they're expecting the Maraje to solve all the problems for them right away. Every answer is going to come from them. Well, that, that's not the case. You know, if your Maraje, for example, says something regarding history, well, Again, I'm sure they studied it. It's obvious that they studied it in their house of studies, but there are possibly more qualified scholars who don't have legal expertise, but maybe they have historical expertise. Likewise, right now, in figuring out how to deal with the kind of akhlaqi issues of, let's say, being at home right now, being self-quarantined, parenting issues, schooling issues, a marja, if they don't have the expertise in Islamic education or Islamic parenting, yeah, of course, they can give you the legal boundaries. But, you know, they're not going to be able to give you, let's say, very deep points on what you can do to, to improve spousal or uh, relationships between you and your children, for example, right? So now, uh, let me just give you an example, a personal example, because uh, it really hits home for me. So, in the same idea about juris, uh, knowing your jurisdiction. So health experts sometimes go beyond their bounds, just like certain scholars will also go beyond their jurisdiction. So a health expert, a medical expert, someone who is an expert in a certain science, their job is to provide a framework, right? Their job is to provide a framework of solutions based on the empirical model. That's it, right? We all know, or we should know, that empiricism has its limits, right? This is why scientific quote-unquote fact can change, because there's no such thing as scientific fact in that sense. What happens, though, is because a person maybe hasn't studied the philosophy the metaphysical presumptions and assumptions going into their science, they don't know what their limits are, right? They won't stay in their lane, and that's a big problem. So again, my personal example. A few years ago, my, my, my late father, so he suffered a stroke. And, you know, he was uh, all, uh, he's pretty much on his deathbed. You know, he was struggling for life. So, of course, I had to go and find out what were all the fiqhi legal issues behind that. And I know that's also a big topic that maybe, inshallah, maybe one day, Iqra online can also put a session together. But these end of life, uh, you know, being in this end of life situation, very going through all these issues regarding what to do, what not to do, it can be very difficult, especially if this is one of your loved ones. But for me, seeing my father like this, trying to grab ahkam and fiqh rulings, at the same time, there was members in the community, as well as the doctors, nurses, and medical quote unquote experts who were you know, trying to help uh, our father, they were offering advice that they really shouldn't have been. What I mean is this. So anytime, let's say a nurse or a doctor would stop by to check on my father, right? we'd be in the room, father would be there, he was unresponsive, and you know, he was on a lot of machines and things like this. So they would say, you know, they'd say, yo, Hassan, personally, I wouldn't want to see my father in this condition. I think you should pull the plug. Like, you know, with, what does this have to do with your medical expertise? So, yeah, there's no quality of life here. You should just you know, pull and you know, end his pain. A medical expert, I mean, technically these people, I mean, I don't know the legal aspects of it, but I think they can get in trouble for giving that kind of advice to somebody. And to add to that, even community members who happen to be doctors, because we have plenty of those in our communities too, right? So even doctors from the community were coming up to me, even though they knew what the ahkam were, the opinions of Sayyid Sistani, Sayyid Khamenei, Ayala Pratik, Come and say, I know what the fiqh is, Hassan, but I think you should let your father go. It's really interesting how there's a psychological problem sometimes we all face where we don't have enough information on something. We haven't studied it. Maybe you read like a book or two. I read in, an article on alislam.org. Yes, I know Shaykh Mutahidi's opinion. Mashallah, great. But do you really want to go and act like you're an expert on the subject? Maybe we should humble ourselves and take a step back. So, to summarize this first point, 
for the Maraja and the health experts or any expert or researcher that you're dealing with. Unless you are a real expert in that specific field you're talking about, and specifically you're knowledgeable about the research methodology and the method going in there, it might be best to just stick to what's being said, especially right now with, again, various different opinions, even within the medical community. Right now, the big question is about masks or no masks. If many of you who are aware of these discussions, you know that previously they were saying, no, reserve masks. It's only for people in the uh, health industry, right? In the medical industry. Let them do it. If they're, in, uh, if they're you know, taking care of patients, they need it. But if you don't have symptoms, if you're not coughing or sneezing or you don't have the virus, then don't wear a mask. But now, in many places, they're saying every single person needs to wear a mask. So these things can change day to day because, you know, people like you and I are not medical experts. We have to be careful of offering our opinion there. The second point would be about the actual role of the clergy, meaning the general adama, not the maraja necessarily, but again, your hajjavas, your akhuns, your mullahs, your mulanas, your qiblas, your sheikhs, your sayyids, whoever's in your community, the one that you've got direct, uh, well, now you don't have direct connection to them anymore. But, you know, most of us now have been switching to this virtual platform, our Thursday night programs and everything, it's being pushed virtually, it's online. So there's a lot of information that's out there and there's a lot of speakers addressing this. I think by now, this is probably like the seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth discussion on COVID-19 and how to respond to it, right? So I wanna go back to one point that Sayyid Ali Imran had brought up about this historical discussion. One thing that I think for all the speakers there, I think all of you have probably witnessed this and you probably dealt with it yourself. Something that even before I left home, and of course, upon landing here in the US, I've been asked this uh, countless amount of times. They want this link. People are expecting that, hey, give me an example from the lives of the Ahlul Bayt. For example, tell me that the fifth Imam or the sixth Imam dealt with a plague so we can take their example, take their words, and then we can go and solve the situation right away. So I think people have this idea in their mind that we can directly grab from history, take it from outside of its context and put it here and say, now we just do that and then everything will be great, right? Everything will be khair, inshallah, because we're doing what the imams did, right? And I don't mean to be so uh, insulting here, but sometimes it's a very literalist Wahhabi style mentality that, you know, the, the, whatever was going on there, we have to apply the exact same thing right now. When that may not be the case, right? And a lot of times as what I'm out here, no. Many times, we don't have these specific examples like this, right? So we'll have to look to ulama from all different levels to be able to figure out, okay, let's take a full analysis of history and then figure out how we can apply it, generally speaking, in our scenario, right? What we're dealing with right now. Regardless of that fact, because we do not have, at least I don't, maybe some of the other panelists do, but I don't have direct access to the imam at the time. And generally, as they say, people who claim that they have the direct access and are speaking on his behalf, we have to watch out for them. If this is the case where we don't have these absolute definite answers in front of us, we don't know directly what Islam is saying, what Allah wants us to do, well, then we should humble ourselves and realize that there's going to be differences of opinions happening. Some scholars, for example, this is an example, I'm not saying do this or don't do this, but if some scholars are saying that, okay, yes, we have to quarantine, within your own home, but you can, you can establish your own Jama'ah prayers, right? You and your wife, or you, your wife, and your kids, or if your parents are there, you can have your own Jama'ah. Yes, you're missing on the Jama'ah that's happening at your center and your masjid, but you can recreate it in your house, right? That's fine. Some may advise that. Now, if, let's say, some scholar does come and say, no, you can practice safe Jama'ah, right? Quarantine, social, social distancing, uh, distancing Jama'ah, in your center, as long as you're, you know, how many feet apart? Again, if your marja allows for such a thing to take place, then okay, maybe you and I may not agree with that as those who are involved in Islamic research. But okay, I'm sure this scholar has some reasoning, some research, some istidlal, some argumentation behind how they got there. So for any of us to be so harsh, to be so, as my uh, when my teacher says, so black and white about certain issues, it seems like we have to be careful of, of taking these extreme positions. Because again, we're in a time and age of uncertainty. But with that said, we also have to be careful of scholars and speakers who are pretty much ideologues pushing their agendas all across the world right now, right? 
And then, of course, those who are you know, not involved in Islamic research, when they're back home, they're going to hear these speakers, right? It's going to come through their laptop or their computer or their TV screen, whatever. They're going to hear this person halfway across the world or maybe you know, in their same country, giving some point, some ideology and being very harsh on the opposing side. If that happens, if that happens, then what happens? That individual, that lay person is going to grab this scholar's example and any other lay people in a Facebook chat room or in YouTube comment section or wherever it is, they're also going to spread that same harshness. Again, this is going to also act as a disease. You know? have to be careful of that too. And this is a humble advice for myself and for the, the ulama who are with us today. And for all the speakers, be careful of spreading your own ideology with such uh, intensity. We are in a place right now where communities are already getting divided and we're already dealing with so much. The last thing we want to do, do is divide ourselves based on issues which we're not 100% certain on anyway. We're trying, we're researching in the same way they're doing it in the medical community. Those of us in the Islamic research uh, community are trying to do the same thing. So let's be a bit more open-minded towards different approaches that are there. And for those of us who are lay individuals, just remember that every scholar is working with a set of presumptions behind this idea that they have, right? They're saying a bunch of stuff. Behind that, there's some roots and foundations that you may not be aware of. Even scholars, ulama, can be victims of modernism and postmodernism, empiricism, uh, scientism, theological extremism. So we also have to be on guard and be careful of things like this. It may be beneficial, it may be. Again, I think this is worth discuss, uh, discussing uh, when we open it up to the other ulama. I think it may be worth it for scholars and speakers to start getting in the habit of actually mentioning different opinions that exist. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of scholars do that. They might mention, okay, here's the opinion of the Mutakadimi, here's the opinion of the philosophers, and here's the opinion of the Orafa. Right? And again, it's not that they necessarily let the lay individuals decide, but they're saying, look, there's different opinions. We respect everybody. For example, Bande you know, me, Haqir, I maybe prefer this opinion. Okay, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And it might open up people's mind to be a bit more respectful of, especially ulama, definitely ulama, but at the very least, uh, if not them, then the other individuals who are engaged in these discussions. Though I think all this ties back into how we're going to actually work in these next few months about building an online and virtual community. Uh, personally, I'm not... I know that there are positives to it. I don't know if it's necessarily a positive thing, but I think maybe this is a good time to, uh, you know, I'll pause over here, open it up, and we'll see if the other one I have something to say. Thank you, Sayyid Hassan. Uh, that was very, uh, that was mind blowing. That was a mind blowing talk. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I just had a point to make. I know you were, you spoke about the. Uh, the marja'iya and the experts, you know, the mutakhassasin that we have. Um, you know, this is something that I was thinking about because if you recall, uh, you know, before you head off to the U.S., you were you were in Iran as well just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I think we were observing sort of the reactions. Uh, for people who don't know, like, if you want to see what Iranians are thinking and what's going on in Iran, like, we don't go to the news. We go to Telegram or ETA, and, you know, we have these uh, social media outlets. <laughs> That's where all the action is going on, basically. So anyways, we were reading all the, you know, opinions of the ulama. Everyone was getting involved, basically, trying to analyze and dissect the, uh, you know, the outbreak. Uh, politicians were there and so on. But one thing that sort of was coming to my mind was, you know, the marja'iya from day one, as you also mentioned, you know, it, you know, actually one of the complaints was that why isn't the marja'iya doing anything? That was one of the sort of, you know, criticisms that was coming out, even within Iran. Why? Because the marja'iyah was simply saying, if you recall, Agha Maqara made a video, I think Agha Subhani, like, you know, five minute video saying, you know, follow the experts here. These are some du'as that you guys can recite. But despite that, people were like, well, wait, why isn't the marja'iyah doing anything? And it's like, wait, what do you expect them to do? Like, what do you want them to do? And, you know, this idea, this, this sort of, uh, you know, something came to my mind, which was that, you know, in our communities, when we are, you know, giving lectures, for example, you know, you have that average youth, sometimes they may come up to you and say, oh, Malana Saab, you know, I don't believe in taqlid. I don't want to do taqlid. Prove to me why is taqlid wajib. And the standard example that everybody gives, you know, that we've been hearing since we were like kids, was the doctor example. And you say, oh, you know, brother, like, do you not, what do you do when you get sick? Who do you go to? You go to the doctor and if the doctor tells you something, do you not listen to him blindly? 
you know that's that's the kind of argument that we give so we have been using for decades the doctor example to prove actually that you have to follow a marja but despite that i felt like people kind of lost that original argument that was used you know for for many people uh, actually that, that is actually the argument that they use even in, in you know advanced classes of usul and, and fiqh. That is the argument, the seerah of the uqala. What is the practice of the you know the rational people of a community, of a society? What do they do when they don't know something? When they have jahal and when they have ignorance towards something, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go to the expert, the, guy, the person who knows, who has that ilm. And hence we use that concept. We take the example of a doctor which people are more used to. And then we say, okay, you do the same thing when it comes to a marja. But for some reason, when it came to this incident, people were trying to look for like approval for what the doctors were saying from the marja'iyah. And the marja'iyah was just saying, you know, no, follow them, follow the experts. Um, and I have felt that this is sort of, uh, you know, sort of alludes to a, maybe a, a deeper problem in the way we are thinking, in the way we have been sort of brought up to think. Uh, because as you, as we all know, when you read the books of, you know, fiqh and usul, and when you read these uh, scholarly works as well, we know this is not the way we're supposed to be thinking. In in this situation, there is no need for an approval from a from a marja who is a scholar in law uh, to figure out what you're supposed to do on a on a on a you know when it comes to your health, for example. Yeah, if there's general advice from the riwayat and so on, and the and the marja himself has expertise in that field as well. And that's a different story. But over here, we were talking about a, an, a, you know, a breakout, and this is a decision that is being made at a on a national level by the health ministries of a country, you know, who are all under a, you know, an organized body and so on. But yet, you know, people were there, and unfortunately, even when we saw when the when the shrines were shut, you know, there were groups of individuals who, you know, and in Qom they they broke down the door, unfortunately. Um, so unfortunately, as I said, I, I felt that this pointed to a deeper, deeper issue. So that was one of the things that I wanted to mention. Um, thank you, said Ali and said Hassan for both your contributions. Um, and I think it's really important to point out that even this approach of um, demanding things from the marja, this pseudo sort of intellectual approach um, that sh the marja should be doing this, you know, um, telling us the obligation of marja, it's a misunderstanding of what the marja is, as you guys mentioned. What baffles me is that the marja is a scholar of law, right? They have, and as said, Hassan mentioned, they have studied the other disciplines, but they may not necessarily be as well versed in them as they are in the legal aspects of the tradition. Um, so you don't get anyone questioning the theologians, the mutakallimin. You know, we have whole people that are ex experts in uh, discussions of aqaid no one asks them what are they doing why haven't they spoken no one asks for example where are the orafa where the mystics um so this is even a misunderstanding of the role of the marja'i and maybe this is something we can look into in further detail what is the marja there for what do you refer to them to um in regards to and so just to before we bring come to the final points we had a few questions uh, just to touch on them thank you all for tuning in and wa alaykum salam to all the people that sent the salam um, just regarding, we had a question about how to help people in uh, war-torn countries respond to the challenges. It's really difficult. I mean, there's no easy answer. There's no one answer. Every situation will be different. First and foremost, we have to make sure we're not just sending the odds um, and thoughts and prayers, but we're also trying to help in practical, and when I say practical, I mean in uh, material ways, if we can, if we can send uh, money, doctors, supplies, first and foremost, that should be our response. But when speaking to them and helping them, if we look at the narrations regarding um, how people dealt with balaya, how they dealt with tribulations, there's a constant reminder that we're not limited to this one world. So while you may see uh, difficulties here and you may feel that it's more than your fair share um, you should know that this is not the only world it's a temp temporary world it's a temporal world and then there is a world after this really bringing back the idea of God God's mercy that this pain cannot be um, it will not go unnoticed and you will get your recompense so if you had to put in more than your uh, then you if you had to put up with more pain than 
um, you should have had to, because other people are not doing their responsibilities, then know that there is justice awaiting. Um, and also for you, and if you look at a lot of the narrations, even regarding actually, uh, if you look at the Sunni narrations, which I was checking last night, um, regarding Ta'un and Wabad, regarding the pandemics, they speak about one of, they give mechanisms of how to deal with this situation. And a lot of them, for example, they say someone who dies of the, uh, of a plague or Ta'un or Wabad, any of those, they die as a shaheed, right? Um, so here, rather than give them actual direct advice, what these narrations were doing, what they are doing in them, um, should they be accurate, is they're giving them a coping mechanism. And sometimes that's all we can offer. Um, I mean, there's a whole, what exactly, what points we should make exactly is that requires a whole discussion in itself. But we should, we should try and help people through sometimes, not provide absolute answers. Sometimes answers that people come to themselves uh, through reflection on certain points are much more powerful for them and much more helpful in letting them get through, in helping them get through uh, certain points in their life that you just telling them something and asking them to accept it is not as um, constructive or powerful. Another question that we had was, by my colleague and good friend Sheikh Hassan Roshandil, um, who is better suited to answer. He's asking about whether places can have significance. Does a place, a makan, have any significance in the dua for? Of, I think I want to mention one point here, and some of the brothers mentioned it, is we do not have a clear idea exactly of how God works. Right, even when we mention a system, and this is pointing to a question from Brother Habib Mazahir, that why when we talk about cause and effect, we're not talking about simple cause and effect. We're talking about a system of cause and effect, and we do not understand all the factors at play. We do not understand all the different considerations that come together, all the different elements that come together to make something happen. What does God uh, take into consideration? How God? Um, what? And I mean, speaking like this is almost blasphemous, but what impacts God's decisions, right? Um, so, yeah, it's very possible that Makan has, um, that a place has a specific, it can play a specific role in helping a supplication being answered. I haven't seen clear arguments for this. There are things that point towards it within our corpus, um, but it, it isn't an established sort of, practice when even in the early days when people used to visit the uh, graves of the imams and such um, it was to pay respects it wasn't to go there and ask for their hajat for their um, needs there may have been cases but what i'm saying is that for me it's not clearly established what is established though is the purity of the dua the sincerity of the dua it should be khalis it should be uh, purely for God, the way that it's done, the time that it's done, you know, in Jofal Layl, in the midst of the night. These things have been emphasized, um, but the Makan, I'm sure it can have an impact, but like I said, we don't know exactly how God functions. Regarding the cause and effect, I think we pointed that. Should we, and I'll, I'll let the other brothers if they want to answer, I don't want to answer all of them. Um, did anyone want to answer any of those points? Or should I make my final points and we'll come back to this? My final point that I wanted to make, sorry, I just decided I will make the final point, um, is where do we go from here? We really need to understand that the approach that some people have taken has been, has a potential to be detrimental. From the very beginning, we might have forgotten now, um, many, you know, as time has passed, we've forgotten how people reacted in the first week and the second week. We had the same people who were denying it and calling it a conspiracy in the first week. By the third, fourth week, telling everyone to stay home. Then, you know, flip and flop. There's a lot of changes going on. And this is natural, obviously. Information comes in. We adjust our, um, we adjust our own points of view, we, our, our own understanding based on that information. But this also tells us we should be careful about announcing our view. We should wait. We should let things pass. We shouldn't jump. To giving out our views and also what type of mentality are we pushing out there to people this is a beautiful time to get bring people closer to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but in the beginning i remember people were opposed to this idea of closing down the masajid now is that really helpful is that something that you know people should be promoting 
this mentality all goes back down to mentality we have of religion, how we perceive and see religion. I think going forward, we really need to realize that if we do not, if we do not work out a mechanism to deal with such situation phenomena that are uh, these phenomena, tribulations, and all of these other things, we will see a lot of damage done to our community. We need to find mechanisms to deal with this. One of them is educating ourselves exactly what does Islam say. This was an attempt to touch on that and hopefully start discussions regarding that. What does religion have to offer? Is it claiming that it has something to offer in every single um, discussion? All of these things need to be looked at and we really need to look within ourselves and think um, about the state of our religious education, what it's at, how much importance have we given it? How much importance are we giving it? Um, and if we really want to be able to, if we don't want every single crisis to throw us into a internal crisis and feel that our faith is, you know, being weak. And I spoke to some friends yesterday and they said that um, they've been having conversations with their congregation and people are now having a crisis of faith. They don't know, they're having questions about God. They're having questions about the religion because certain certain things that they thought thought should happen and things that they sh thought shouldn't happen have happened and now they're thinking how can you know how can this god that i believed in do this so i think this really is the time for us to um again continue praying for everyone but also take steps to make sure we're able to deal with these crises better in the future the first step which i believe in all of this is education, education in its most general sense, education about crisis themselves, education about what the religion says, education about people and how to talk to people. Um, people are definitely suffering. People are definitely, some people have been more impacted. They've had, they've lost people, uh, family members, loved ones in this crisis and how to talk with them. Do we tell them all the same messages? Um, you know, especially when it comes to publicly sharing messages, sometimes you share a message and it, someone may have, had a particular experience, that public message of yours may uh, make it more difficult for them or may make the situation worse mentally for them. Anyway, this is just something I think I wanted to make sure we did touch on, the importance of learning and continuing to learn from this epidemic while taking all the safety measures. Going forward, forward with a commitment to make sure we educate ourselves as much as possible. Um, and I will pass on to whoever is whoever's in the queue. Jazakallah, Sayyidna Hadi, for your second lecture. <laughs> There's more to come. <laughs> Inshallah, yeah, of course. No. Um, there is a lot of questions, and uh, you know, forgive us for all the uh, to all the viewers that we won't be able to go through everything uh, in depth. I think maybe what we want to try is uh, go through a few of them we'll show them on the screen and give kind of cheesy dollar menu mcdonald's one-line answers and then if they require you know deeper explanations maybe we can set up a separate session for that so we'll quickly let me just scroll okay so if, uh habib he says what do you think of the argument that accepting the world only works with causality is like what the jews say that allah are closed or locked or tied uh i think the argument stinks Thank you for your question. Next. Allah's the one who made the system of causality. He's the one on top, so he can decide to do what he wants. He's always the top. And um, Sheikh Sadiq had already mentioned this in his, uh, his points. I think he expounded upon it greatly. Uh, next question. I'm skipping the Farsi ones. I don't know why we have people giving me Farsi comments. This is for an English speaking audience, so inshallah, we'll stick to the language of the Tawud. Uh, so Brother Hussein Rizvi. Saying, should we be praying for the pandemic to end, or should we be praying for protection from the virus, considering as both positive and negative impacts in the world? So even within that question, yes, everything has positivity and negativity. There's always positive and negative. Uh, there's different levels of dua that the ulama talk about. One level is you can say, well, you know, if you're praying for yourself, say, I don't want to get sick. I want my family to be protected. That's one style of dua which some ulama at a higher level will say that's a bit selfish. Your ego is involved in the dua. Others will say that you're, once you get to higher levels of a connection with God, these details will be left out. You won't be praying specifically for things of 
getting better or worse. You'll say, Allah, you know what's khair, and you kind of leave it like that. But again, that's a bigger discussion. Say, Havi, did you want to add to that? I see you're, un you're unmuted. No? You can mute yourself. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, Brother Zain Taha is saying, uh, thank you for your comments on the acceptance of different opinions, especially when it arises in these uncertain times. The question is, how do we tackle those who establish rigid, harsh opinions? Rather, how do we protect the general public from these irrational opinions? Well, we, we can't be the police all the time. And I don't even think being the police is a good idea. Uh, you should, I think it makes sense for most of us to stick to our own intellectual journey. And naturally, like one of our, our teachers, I think pretty much most of us had the same teacher back home, whose name I'll leave. But he always used this term organic, right? Organ organic movements. And I think for, for both sides, if you already have a method, you have an opinion, you're trying to do something, you're trying to grow, it doesn't make sense to go grab somebody else who's really not ready for that style. I don't want to use the words better or worse. I know I use the words harsh and rigid, uh, again, just to help us understand it and frame it in our minds. But look, generally speaking, aktharahum la ya'lamun, right? We have a Quranic concept of how the general public acts. Now, we can do our best to try to inform them using points and akhlaqi methods, but we shouldn't, again, if we don't want them to, them to be the other group to be rigid and harsh, we also shouldn't come with this intellectual rigidness and harshness as well. Again, because the doors of, of research are always open, we also have to keep that in our mind. So we do our duty, we do our due diligence, we research, we share with those who can handle it, and otherwise, you, know, you don't have to take it so seriously. Calm down a little bit, take a deep breath. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, all of you, could we please have such discussions more often? If it is feasible, of course. Yeah, we can. We'll plan for that. And then, we want to, do we have time for this last one or not? What do you guys say? Quickly. Uh, with regard to the issue raised of the Marjariya's authority in such scenarios and the attitude of the lady, does the problem lie solely in the muqaddadin from the ground up, or is there something to be said of the broader extension of authority from the top down? That's a great question, but a very dangerous question. So I think there is, it does seem like there, and again, I don't know what the esteemed ulama have to say, but it does seem like there's a two-pronged issue here, two-pronged uh, two Yes, The lady sometimes will close the doors off, meaning instead of inviting qualified ulama and speakers, those who have studied properly to their centers, they want to get somebody who, again, they're self-studied. Again, not to say that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I'm just giving you an example. They'll invite people whose, their expertise doesn't lie in the subject matter that they're discussing. Meaning a person's coming and they're talking about FIP when maybe they should be, their expertise was in, let's say philosophy or vice versa, whatever it happens to be. The other issue with this, like we mentioned before, sometimes the problem is that the ulama themselves are outside, they're going outside their jurisdiction, right? Personally, my own humble personal opinion is that since the laymen generally don't have access to Islamic knowledge, Islamic sources, the hawas, the things like this, the, I feel that the sole or more of the blame lies on the higher authorities, those coming from the top down, not the highest, highest, I don't mean like majai and things like that. I mean those who are speaking on their behalf, who end up causing rifts in our communities. If they actually studied properly, and they saw that one of the benefits of the Hawza is to learn and to swim through these different opinions and to respect one another, right? As those who are watching among the ulama, dafi dakhl muqaddar, right? To defend other people and to uh, give people the benefit of the doubt, husn al and all this. It doesn't seem like a lot of students and ulama have grabbed that benefit from the Hawza. And unfortunately, they're spreading a more disgusting play in our community. So we have to be on guard and hopefully... Uh, Just hope to... Yeah, um, Chef Salih. So I'm going to jump in there. There's something I wanted to add previously. We spoke about half an hour on the role of the scholars and the role that the marja plays and the role that the ulama have to play. One thing that we can't ignore and seems to be the elephant in the room, you can say, is the role that the lazy have to play, the role that the public have to play. And we're living at a time, as Sayyid Ali mentioned, that questions are appearing that previously never caused the problems amongst the youth that they do now.
questions that make people reflect on what they believe, questions that make them reflect on the matter that they hold to, questions that make them reflect on things that earlier generations wouldn't have even thought about thinking about or wouldn't even question. And now you'll have people who are young, who are, you know, they're growing they're going to universities, they got jobs, they're living their life, and they begin to think about things that you know were taken as principles of religion previously in the earlier generations. And this also means that as the public, there needs to be a push for intellectual courage, there needs to be a push for intellectual humility, and there needs to be some sort of proactive intellectual movement from the grassroots as well itself. Because at the end of the day, we could sit here and we can say the scholars are acting outside of their jurisdiction, not saying that they are, but it could be insinuated. Um, that the scholars are, you know, they're not helping nurture the grassroots as they should be. And, you know, we could put all the blame on the scholars, on the, all the scholars. But I think there is a huge discussion to be had on how the the public, how the laity, they themselves now need to equip themselves. They now need to actually be able to engage in a level suitable to their understanding, suitable to their education. They shouldn't feel afraid to ask questions. They should feel encouraged to ask if you encourage to ask questions about things that may be incentive for them, it's very important. Uh, until this, you could say, this vibe or this movement of sort of thing takes, doesn't take over the grassroots, doesn't take over the youth, doesn't take over the intellectual community, then we won't really see a change because the change has to come from both sides. It has to come from the scholars, of course. It has to be an increase in. Uh, their ability to nurture and cultivate a community, make it very clear the direct frameworks that they work in. And as well, there needs to be a push from the other side. We frankly live at a time where it's not possible, really is impossible, problems that we face, uh, issues that religion faces in general, challenges that we face externally, discussions that go on internally. It really is impossible in this day and age for someone to bury their head in the sand and just say, oh, I'm just going to go to the mosque, I'm just going to take a verse on the pulpits, I'm just going to go with that, and that's going to be my ABC on a, on a black and white worldview based on that. That isn't how it's going to hurt. That's not how it's going to work. And taking an approach like that can actually be very detrimental in an information age that we live in. So that's the first thing we need to be able to get a vibe, get a movement going, get this impetus going from the grassroots so that people actually care about knowledge. That's another thing we could look at. Why, why, why is it that grassroots don't really care about knowledge? Why is it that it's got... Okay, so I think we were having some serious uh, <laughs> serious technical issues that actually we were expecting. Uh, that We didn't have any technical issues, but Sorry, Sadiq, I think we had to uh, just cut you off there because we couldn't hear anything. But anyways, yeah. uh, we're going to actually wrap it up because we've, we're have we actually way past scheduled time that we had allocated for this discussion. Um, once again, uh, once again, oh, is he still speaking? <laughs> okay. So we're going to wrap it up, guys, uh, brothers and sisters. Sorry for any questions that we did not address. Um, uh, as you can tell, this was our first time doing something like this, and we did not actually have any. We do not have any plans uh, to continue this, but now because we're looking at some of the feedback and comments that are being made, uh, inshallah, we'll think about it and we'll see how to, uh, you know, uh, move forward with this uh, idea and so on, inshallah. Uh, at the end, once again, I want to thank everybody uh, who was on the panel: uh, Sadiq, uh, Megji, Hadi Rizvi, Said Hassan. And uh, inshallah, we want to end with the dua and uh, you know, pray to Allah. So he keeps us all safe during this time. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma adkhil ala ahlin qubur al-surur. Allahumma agni kulla faqir. Allahumma ashbi' kulla jaya. Allahumma aksu kulla uriyan. Allahumma aqtidayna kulli madin. Allahumma farj an kulli. Allahumma fukka kulla asir. Allahumma aslih kulla fasid min umur al-muslimin. اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم سد فقرنا بغناق اللهم غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اقض عنا الدين واغننا من الفقر انك على كل شيء قدير once again thank you brothers and sisters we will try to put the audio recording of this as a podcast uh, on the website and also on the facebook page 
So for those who do not want to watch the video or there was some lag in the video, inshallah, we'll put the uh, you know audio on a podcast and brothers and sisters can listen to that. Thank you once again. Wa barakatuh. Thank you all. Thank you all. It looks like my mic has come back, but it's too late now, I suppose. Inshallah, next time. It's this internet we have over here. No comments. All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Until next time, fi amanillah.